Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our Play Day virtual conference. I'm Laura Masterson, the Community Manager here at TypeSafe. Um, and uh, we mentioned that these are going to be recorded. Um, we're going to be making all of the presentations available on our website and YouTube channel shortly after we wrap up. So expect those um, in about a day or so. Um, our next speaker is Roger Dietz. He's a software architect at Angie's List. He's going to be talking to us about lessons and challenges and fun that he's experienced um, with play at Angie's List. So with that, I'm going to hand things over um, to Roger. Uh, and Roger, take it away. Thank you, Laura. <coughs> Hope everyone is having a good day today. We have some beautiful weather here in Indianapolis, Indiana, so I hope everyone else is equally as lucky. We're very excited to talk a little bit about our experience using Scala and the Play Framework here at Angie's List. As the title of the presentation <clears throat> hopefully shows, this is a, a relatively new thing for us. Um, we'll talk a little bit more as the presentation goes on about where we started from and what we were trying to do. But we are relatively new newbies here to Play, um, but we've had a lot of fun with it. and. We've done a lot of good work with it, and we've experienced some challenges. So hopefully we'll be able to share some of our wisdom with you guys, and, and we look forward to being a bigger part of the Scala and Play and, and TypeSafe community. So yeah, again, my name is Roger Dietz. I'm part of the uh, platform team here at Angie's List. Our platform team is responsible for overseeing the overall architecture of the site. So Angie's List has a <clears throat> large commercial website application for our members and also tools for service providers to connect with those members. <clears throat> in case you don't know very much about Angie's List, we were founded in 1995 by Angie Hicks and, and Bill Osterley. So yes, there really is an Angie, and yes, she really does appear on campus. <clears throat> She's not only on the national TV commercials. <clears throat> We're headquarters here in Indianapolis, Indiana. We have a um, office in Denver that was part of an acquisition from a couple years ago, but most of our staff and most of our engineering um, leadership is here in, in Indianapolis. <clears throat> We're growing very rapidly. We presently have upwards of 1,500 employees, um, around 70 of which are part of our engineering department. <clears throat> We're a publicly traded company on NASDAQ. Ticker symbol is ANGI. We've been public since around November of, of 2011. <clears throat> we have about 3 million paid members that are actually subscribed to the Angie's List service. So sort of the original business model that Angie's List pursued was to allow members to purchase a membership for some period of time, say a year or three years, something like that. <clears throat> And by purchasing a membership, they'd be able to log into our website and have access to our database of reviews of, of local service providers. So someone would visit the site, they would use some service like a handyman, a roofer, a plumber, something like that. They would have either a good or bad experience with that provider. Then they would return to Angie's List and <clears throat> write a review that described their experience when the work was done, how much it cost, that sort of thing. And they would give grades to those providers on the standard sort of elementary school grade scale of, of A through F. <clears throat> and Angie's List would, would roll those grades up and, and produce um, an aggregate grade for those providers, which would then feed, feed information to future members who were going to use the service. <clears throat> so service providers do not pay to be on Angie's List. They either um, become listed on Angie's List through the process of, of signing up, that they can sign up for free and, and sort of manage their profile and, and have, their, have their business information displayed. Um, or if a member submits a, a review for a provider that's not already on the list, we'll add them into, into the database. We have approximately 300,000 service providers uh, covering almost all the United States. And uh, those providers um, are searchable by members depending on their, the member's geographic location. So members will, will search for providers that are near them by default, though with certain tiers of our membership you can have the ability to search uh, the nationwide database. 
And over the course of having been in business, we've collected almost 7 million reviews that power the reputation for these individual service providers. <clears throat> so kind of the classic Angie's List model was, was, we, was very much do-it-yourself, almost in the spirit of, of home services. We let members sign up for the service. We had a valuable database of, of review information. And they would come to Angie's List, and they would, um, they would search the database, find the providers they liked, and then hopefully come back later and write a review about that provider. However, as Angie's List has, has grown and matured and our critical mass of members and service providers and reviews has been reached, um, we've started to sort of redefine our mission to enable happy transactions between members and service providers. So it's not just enough to let a member come to the site, do a search, find something, and then be on their own to call the provider and schedule the appointment and make sure the work is done. and and then hopefully come back later and write a review, we actually want to facilitate that transaction and make sure that members are getting a positive experience with providers that we know to be good and make sure that the providers have access to you know, our very high quality membership base. So as we took our existing infrastructure, which was very much a typical Microsoft stack, um, we had SQL Server, sort of at the bottom as our database layer, a gigantic SQL server that essentially we have um, only able to scale up vertically. Our application layer was built out exclusively on the .NET framework using C Sharp, using ASP.NET. <clears throat> as we started to adapt the, the business model from more just a database of reviews where um, members did all their own homework to a more transactional model where we were sort of the exchange in between a transaction between members and service providers, we found that our, our legacy stack was, was just simply not flexible nor per performant enough to really take the technology in the direction that we wanted to take to support where we wanted to go with the business. So it's a gigantic testament to the technology that we were able to run the business on it for, for nearly 15 years since we built the first public version of the website. But like anything that's been around 15 years, the, the code gets a little crazy, the database gets gigantic, um, and the, the requirements change and the, and the expectations of users change. And so we found ourselves in a position where we really needed to iterate very quickly. And our legacy code base was, was made it difficult to do that. Um, so about a year ago, we started to evaluate what do we need to do to enable the business to move faster and enable a platform that could be more flexible and more adaptable to what the business was trying to do. And so as we started to kind of spitball this idea of, hey, Angelus wants to become more of a marketplace and, and less of a database of reviews, you know, what does the system look like that we would use to actually build, build that platform? And so we decided that we would start with a new technology stack. <clears throat> and it's really important from our perspective that it, this wasn't just a rewrite, this wasn't just a port, um, because some of us who've been around the business you know, long enough know that rewrites and ports are, are almost, a, almost a dirty word. Like those are very dangerous, it's very difficult to run those kinds of projects, especially when you're a large company and, and when you have, you know, a, a established user base and if you're under the eye of Wall Street and all those sorts of things. So rebuilding a platform, starting from scratch, rewriting everything is, is usually a terrible, terrible idea. But the way that we approached this problem to be able to enable the business to move more quickly was not to approach it as we're going to rewrite everything that we have, but rather we're going to build new products and we're going to build out new services and we're going to build those products and services in, in a flexible fashion that can adapt quickly and then eventually start to you know, move more of our, our um, business information you know, to, to that new stack so, and that new platform. So we chose to, to use a new technology stack. <clears throat> and when we considered what attributes this technology stack would have, I mean, we looked at a few different things. One, we wanted to move um, to an open source platform to you know, 
kind of avoid licensing costs and, and be able to take advantage of a lot of the great work that's, that's going on in, in the modern open source world. We wanted to have a, an architecture and a platform that would support um, very high, high concurrency and, and horizontal scalability. So as I said before, our SQL Server stack essentially got to the point where we could only scale it vertically and we wanted to build a more distributed system that would allow us to more cheaply and, and easily scale out horizontally. We wanted to have a very flexible platform and a very flexible stack that we could iterate on quickly, push things out rapidly from a developer's desktop through a QA environment into production so that we could iterate and, and A-B test and do all the other things that the business was hungry to do to be able to build new products and new user experiences that would um, enable you know, what the business was going for. And second of all, or maybe not second of all, but finally, um, within our engineering group, we wanted to inject some excitement and some, and some new blood and some new talent. So Angie's List running on a Microsoft stack here in Indianapolis, Indiana, you know, we weren't necessarily known as a, as, as a cutting edge or um, a super you know, forward-thinking high-tech company. But we had a number of really bright people here, and we really felt that we had a, a big opportunity with this move to a new business model to really change that and to really become a, a first-class um, high-tech modern technology company that would be able to attract top talent from not only the Midwest but from, from across the country. And so we wanted to pick a stack and, and tool set that would be really you know, sexy and in, inviting and something that the team here could get excited about and also was something that we could bring in you know, more folks from around the country to, to help us out and, and pursue this big, crazy, ambitious, ambitious goal we're after. So we underwent a number of different things, not only to ramp up our recruiting efforts and and you know, kind of do community outreach, which is partially why we're participating in, in some of these things like webinars. But also we sent all of our engineers through, um, through Scala training and through Play Framework training using the, the type safe materials. And it's been really wonderful to watch our, our bright engineers who had been you know, working with C Sharp and, and ASP.NET for quite some time to learn a new skill, to stretch their brains in a new direction, and to really embrace um, this new technology stack. <clears throat> so we're using Scala, of course. We're using Play fr Framework, of course. We're using Slick. Right now we're connected to a, a, a MySQL database. All of this stuff is, is running in Amazon. We're very close to doing uh, fully automated provisioning and deployments using things like Puppet and Docker to enable the infrastructure to, to adapt very quickly. <clears throat> And we're using a little bit of Akka for, for a smaller piece of our application that does some data migration. Um, I expect that we'll use more Akka in the future, though we're not using a ton of that now. If you want to see some of our work in action, you can go to snapfix.angieslist.com and download our, our mobile app and service that's, that's powered by this new technology stack. So that was our first product that started to actually make it into the wild after having made the decision to move forward with, with this new platform. There's also a really awesome TV commercial for that, for that app. Hopefully you've seen it maybe somewhere across the country. Okay, so we took our gigantic C-sharp monolithic ASP.NET SQL Server stack. We identified the need for a new platform. We identified kind of the platform that we wanted to choose for, for a number of reasons. And, you know, so what did we, what have we built? Where are we today? <clears throat> well, first of all, and most importantly, because shipping software is what wins the day, we have a running production application, both for the Snapfix product, which I just mentioned a moment ago, but also for a small portion of our member base is running on, on this new platform. We haven't yet converted the entire uh, Angie's List member base to this new platform. That's, that's an ongoing project. Um, but it's our, aim, it's our aim to get all of, the, all of the members converted over. But at right now, we do have live in production today, um, you know, a piece of Angie's List running on the Scala Play Slick stack. 
Right now we're at about 65,000 lines of code, including tests. And, you know, that's not a gigantic application. It's going to get much larger, you know, over the course of the next year or so. But, you know, it's very impressive to me that we went from, from you know, essentially zero last, last summer to a, a, the very first version of this running in production in September um, to more of it running live now and in, relatively, in a relatively short period of time. So I feel like that's a, that's a testament to some of the productivity gains that we've seen using the Scala and Play stack to be able to go from essentially zero to production running 65,000 lines of code um, you know, in quite a bit less than a year. I've got a little snapshot here on the right side of, of, of a portion of our, of our um, code layout. So we're using about 10 different play modules and we have about four different actual play web applications that are involved here. So we have different sites that service the members. We have different sites that service the service providers. We have an internal tool that's used by our, our marketplace reps to connect members and service providers. We've got a separate web application that, that helps us um, with, with payments. <clears throat> and then as you can kind of see there, we, we've got the, the overall application broken up into a few different, few different modules. So essentially we're using Play and, and SBT modules to, to organize, that, organize that code into those deployable units. I expect that, that we'll do even more of this modularization down the road, and that's kind of one of our lesson learns that we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, we've really enjoyed how, how Play and SBT and the Scala stack have, have let us um, kind of start small, start with the simplest thing, you know, a, a basic if you do play new and you get yourself a web app up and running, um, and then be able to, to incrementally grow that out to be um, more modularized and, and componentized. <clears throat> On the front end, we're using a variety of different projections for the logic that's, that's backed by the, by the Scala and play applications. So one of our tools, or one of our internal tools uses Spine.js for its front end. We expose a number of different REST APIs, both for internal integration consumption and also for mobile clients. And we're also just using straight up play templates in a number of these apps uh, so that, um, you know, with, with either, you know, just jQuery or, or handlebars or some other lightweight um, JavaScript framework. So on one hand, it's a little bit of a, of a mixed bag of technology and that can provide its own challenges and confusions. But on, on the other hand, it, it's very nice that Play gives us that flexibility to kind of use whatever choices we want on the front end. We can pick the right tool for the job to, you know, to solve the particular use case that, that any given piece of the application uses. <clears throat> so I've kind of been, you know, along the way here talking about some of the, uh, the things that, that we really like about the Play framework. But I think when I pulled the team here, what were their like number one items about play that they really like? These these four things sort of bubbled up to the top. So the fact that there's no that play applications are not required to like be hosted inside an application container like Tomcat or something is something that that's, is really nice and we've really latched onto. So it makes it so that you can run the play app on your desktop full stack, local development, and then, you know, when we push that up to different environments, whether it's QA or stage or production, it's essentially the same, the same configuration. And that's, you know, for some of us who've worked with, with uh, you know, Tomcat and, and application and container servers before, it's really nice not to have that extra layer of, of configuration in there. And with the evolutions, being able to essentially do full stack development on your desktop that works just like the environment that's either in stage or QA or production to keep the database and the code in sync is, has been a, a very big productivity boon for us compared to where we used to be with our, with our .NET stack. So using, um, using SQL Server, ASP.NET, C Sharp, IIS, um, there's, there's nothing nearly as, as easy and convenient for doing that kind of full stack local development as we found within the, the play stack. Along those same lines of, of, of quick, you know, quick iteration and, and fast local development, uh, the team really loves 
play's ability for hot, hot reloading and, and using IntelliJ as, as the debugger. So the, the cycle of make a change in the editor, reload the page, see your change applied, like that's, you know, that's a really great feature, again, that we were missing before. Um, the IntelliJ tools, honestly, I have to say, like, we're still getting used to them. Uh, we come from, from the Microsoft world, and, and Visual Studio is still, like, you know, one of the, uh, one of the great, <coughs> um, one of the great editor IDEs out there. So, you know, I think, I think it took a little bit of, of a while for the team to get used to a different environment um, that, you know, doesn't always have all of the bells and whistles that maybe they're used to. But as we've kind of got up to speed on it, um, using IntelliJ with the, with the Play plugin uh, has something that, that we've, we've really started to like. We do use the ultimate edition of IntelliJ because we need the, the integrated Play plugin for that. So that's something that um, is not available from what I understand in the community edition. Um, but, you know, the team, is, the team has embraced that. We do like the attitude, the design attitude of play that it's sort of async by default. So as I mentioned before, you know, we really wanted to go after a system that would be um, easily distributable and, and asynchronous and as non-blocking as possible to let us do as much horizontal, horizontal scalability, scaling as, as we could do. So the fact that play t embraced asynchronousness and, and non-blocking as its essentially default design choice. We really uh, have liked that, and we think that's going to be a really good choice for our platform um, down the road. And of course, um, as I said earlier on, on the previous slide, the fact that we're very can be very flexible on the front end in terms of how we want to actually project, um, you know, project the data to the different clients. We build a lot of REST APIs, having integrations between um, our system and other systems is, is, is more and more common. You know, part of what was a, a big deal in our, our original legacy stack was that we, you know, 10 years ago we had to build everything from scratch. And so there weren't as many off-the-shelf SaaS or, or third-party providers for um, different features as there are today. And so, so now that in the, in the more modern world we can take advantage of those things and, and to do that then we need to often have API integrations with, with different parties. So the fact that Play, you know, sort of has JSON and REST kind of baked in from the beginning, and the fact that we can kind of choose whatever front end technologies we want to use for the right, for a particular, to solve a particular problem, um, is something the team has really, has been really embraced. But of course, um, with any new technology stack, and especially retraining um, an entire organization around both new tools, new language, new technology, uh, you know, there have been uh, challenges along the way. So, as I mentioned before, you know, we all were used to Visual Studio, and Visual Studio has a lot of you know, very nice features in it. And IntelliJ and the Play plugin are very good as well, but we've noticed that sometimes the IntelliJ plugin will, will lose its mind. And it's kind of hard to know whether it's because of uh, some Scala stuff going on or, or Play Framework stuff or what, but you'll get red squigglies everywhere and, and you'll kind of um, you know, lose your ability to, to work effectively with, with, the, um, with the Play plugin in IntelliJ. And um, again, that's kind of, I think, a cost of doing business that we're willing to um, just live with for now. Hopefully those things will get better over time. Uh, we're currently using Play 2.1, and we definitely know that we need to get ourselves up to the latest version. We've got some tasks in our backlog to, to make that happen, but we haven't done it yet. Um, so we've had some issues trying to get good code coverage metrics um, with our code layout and, and using Play 2.1. So we're, we're optimistic that once we get an upgrade and as we, um, and as we uh, gain some more experience in this area, and hopefully the tools will get better. We'll be able to you know, have full-blown um, good code coverage on our on our different applications. But we've had some challenges getting that to work there. For some of our other um, apps that that aren't quite as intensive with the Play framework, just like the apps that are just um, essentially API-based, they don't have the templating. We've had a little bit of an easier time, um, but that's again one of the challenges that we've kind of faced along the way. Uh, sharing non-trivial presentation code has been a little bit of a challenge. And so this is something where I think we're still, since we're relatively new to the Scala community and, and the Play community, I think we're still 
kind of trying to learn the best practices and, and, the, and the right idioms to solve the problems that we're trying to solve. So we have, as I mentioned before, a couple different websites. One is for members, one is for service providers, and they're different user bases with different use cases, but they do share some overlapping functionality. So service providers can go on and, um, and edit their profile to sort of customize how their business appears to an Angelus member when an Angelus member searches for them. But they want to be able to edit their profile, of course, but then also see it as a member would see it. And so that's an area where the, the presentation layer between the member website and the business center website, that, that's the site for service providers, should really overlap and, and be the same because we want to have you know, the same view layer, the same kind of internal presentation logic, but it's just being used by different user constituencies on different sites. <clears throat> and so we've struggled a little bit to find a good way to share that front-end implementation at, at the right level. So, you know, we want to have the site separate so that they can be deployed separately and, and if there's, you know, a problem in one of the sites it doesn't inadvertently infect the other site. You know, we want to have good granular um, composition of our architecture in that way, but we also naturally don't want to write you know, the same different code in two different places. So, you know, we, we've struggled a little bit to find the, the right balance of, of sharing presentation code. In, in the ASP.NET world, we would have accomplished most of this through a user control. Um, and again, we're, we're just still trying to think, find the right play idiom for doing that sort of thing. We've also fully embraced the cake pattern throughout the code base to help us um, do, you know, dependency injection and essentially manage the relationship between components. And that's been a really good boon for us to help make parts of the application very testable. Um, but within the play framework, to be able to use the, the controllers as they're defined as, as objects in, in the play framework, we've had to come up with a little bit of fancy footwork there that it's not difficult once you actually sort of learn the pattern and, and, and have that pattern applied throughout the code base, like it takes, you know, people get up to speed on it and then they're able to do it. But um, it takes a little, it's a little bit non-obvious and it's something that um, people kind of scratch their heads at a little bit at the beginning when they get used to moving from sort of a simple play new, you know, first play application into, you know, our, our, uh, our larger structure. So we essentially take the, uh, the component registry, which is a piece of code that actually con contains all of the different um, implementations of the, of the components that are part of the cake pattern. We store that in a play plugin, and then we, um, we use that as the essentially access point within the controllers um, for getting access to the different components that they depend upon. And then to, but then to expose that to play, we have this kind of pattern where we have the outside containing object, and then there's a trait with its implementation, and then we have the actual play controller and its applications as an object within that implementation. So it's, again, it's not difficult once you actually kind of grok it, but it has been something that has taken the teams a little bit of time to, uh, to get up to speed with. So lessons learned. And, you know, by no means this is not the complete list. I'm sure there's a million lessons along the way that, that we learned and have since forgotten that we learned them because a lot has changed in this past year and, and it's kind of hard to keep up sometimes. But I think some of the, some of the key takeaways that, that we still would recommend to anyone who's considering um, going out and starting a big new ambitious play project is to, to start with a um, configuration strategy. So again, under a very basic you know, play application, um, you, you've got your comp files and, you know, you can set them up and, and you know, it's not difficult to, to segment configuration based on environments or, or, you know, component or however you choose to it, choose to do it. But once you end up with 10 different modules, four different applications, all kind of playing together and in some cases needing to share configuration, in some cases needing to have different configuration, and then you spread the need for that applications to be deployed across multiple different environments, whether it's QA, stage, uh, production, et cetera. 
the configuration can, can very quickly become complicated and, and hard to follow. And so we didn't really start with a configuration strategy, and now we're working very hard to kind of retrofit one um, and get, uh, get that configuration a little bit more managed and, and under control. So that was something that I think that if we could go back in time or give advice to, to someone would be to, number one, first and foremost, understand how you want your configuration to be managed, and then second, enforce that with an iron fist so that all the different teams and groups and applications follow the same kind of pattern. <clears throat> Another lesson I think learned is that, you know, be willing and able to split up your application into as small of pieces as possible. So, you know, we have essentially four, face, four you know, public facing websites and some of those websites are, have gotten rather large and our routes files particularly have gotten quite gigantic. And in, in consultation with TypeSafe and, and some other people, um, you know, one of the things that, that I think the Scala community is definitely aware of is that compilation times can be very long. And so our use of a smaller number of larger applications with um, essentially gigantic routes files has really pushed some of our compilation times to the point where it's, it's kind of hard to deal with. So I think that the, the advice that we've picked up recently and we're trying to put into practice is that you would want to split your, your routes files as, as small as you can, but, but no smaller. So have essentially well-defined, organized groups of routes that go with the same application together. And as soon as you start to mix you know, different disciplines within the same routes file, you need to ask yourself, you know, just architecturally, is that the right thing to do? But then also keep in mind that the larger that routes file gets is, is the much longer the compilation time is going to take. So I think that, again, using a crystal ball, we would go back and, and have a clear plan for actually um, splitting up the routes files into smaller units and, and being able to um, hopefully reduce the compilation time within each of those applications. But the last one here, being a little bit cheeky, is that the lesson that we've learned is that Scala and Play really are a, a ton of fun. Um, it's been really exciting to see a group of engineers band together and get started on a new language. Um, <coughs> we actually learned that I think the transition to C sharp from C sharp to Scala it has in a lot of ways been easier than some people who've transitioned from Java to Scala because in C sharp everyone was very used to using um, passing functions, you know, lambda functions to other functions. A lot of the language integrated query features of, of the .NET framework are heavily influenced by functional concepts. So our engineers I think embraced the move from C sharp to Scala quite easily. And they definitely embraced the move from ASP.NET Web Forms into the Play Framework. So Web Forms, if you've ever programmed um, in, in the Microsoft ASP.NET stack, especially using Web Forms, you know, Microsoft worked very, very hard to make web application development feel like desktop application development. So you would, you know, double click on a button on a form and it would create a C-sharp code behind event handler and then through the magic of, of um, ASP.NET, it would, you know, make that, make that work within the HTTP, you know, protocol context. And um, in some of our projects towards the end of our time with the legacy framework, we did start to use ASP.NET MVC a little bit, but making the move to play, which is much more web native, much more web friendly, just from a design perspective, it's much more geared towards actually building, you know, modern HTTP web applications, not pretending they're desktop applications, has, has been really a breath of fresh air and it's been a lot of fun for the developers to, to kind of discover the joy of building a low-fat website, you know. Some of the ASP.NET infrastructure feels very heavy and, and the play framework feels um, very light and clean, so we, we really, we really enjoyed that. <clears throat> 
So, you know, what's, uh, what's ahead for Angie's List? Um, well, as I said, we are continuing to improve our Scala knowledge. We're, we're continuing to improve our play framework knowledge. Um, you know, we're, we're really excited about this new platform. We're really excited about this new stack. Um, you know, we feel like this is a good move technically for, for the infrastructure and for Angie's List as a business. Um, and, you know, right now we're just having a ton of fun. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. It's definitely a, a challenge across a large organization to, to turn the ship around and, and get people using a new stack. But, uh, you know, TypeSafe has been very supportive and very helpful. Um, we've gotten some really great training. And, you know, and if, if you have a set of engineers that are, that are ready and willing to, to pick up something new, which I would suspect that everyone who's on this call is, is someone like that because that's why you're here, um, you know, I would really encourage you to go for it because it's been, it's been a lot of fun. And um, in my, my architecture role, I don't do a whole lot of code writing anymore these days. I tend to be more um, cat herding, but, um, but it, it has sort of renewed, you know, renewed my interest in, in uh, you know, writing really good code and, and, and the joy that comes with software development kind of once again. So we feel really good about that. And, and we appreciate TypeSafe's help, and, and we're looking forward to, um, you know, next versions of Play and, and Scala and, and, and Slick. So I uh, really appreciate everyone's time here, and I'm really honored that we had a chance to talk about some of the things that the Angie's List has learned on this journey we've been on. Um, I see a number of questions here in the, in the chat panel that I'll try to uh, address quickly, unless Laura has anything else. Um, she wants to add. Uh, no, that was fantastic. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Roger. Really enjoy hearing how, hearing how you came to play in Scala. Um, yeah, let's take some time for uh, some questions. Looks like we have about ten minutes um, that we can dedicate to that. So, is there are in the question pod here, Roger? Is there anything you'd want to kick off with? Yeah, uh, I'll have a couple of them here that were surround that are on um, testing, so I'll, I'll talk about that real briefly. Okay. Uh, yes, we certainly have uh, unit tests. It's very important to us to have uh, really high code coverage via unit tests for as, as much of the application as is practical. Um, so we use Specs two uh, and Makito, essentially the the play sort of the play default testing frameworks. Um, we use unit testing extensively, and, and the cake pattern has helped us, um, you know, apply testability um, to, you know, basically all the different components of the of the application. Um, <clears throat> we also have a number of integration tests that we try to embed side by side with the uh, with the application themselves, so that we can run ideally on a dev machine the integration tests actually hitting HTTP endpoints, getting, or getting responses back, validating them, and then run those, um, run those exact same tests against like, like a QA environment, so to make sure the behavior is the same. So, so we do have tests. We essentially organize the, the tests um, right next to the, the, the code under, you know, under test, you know, following pretty much the, the standard play layout. Um, and uh, that's been worked out pretty well for us as well. Great. Uh, there's a question in here um, about in terms dealing of code with code coverage. We're using. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no. Go ahead. I was just going to knock off a couple more of these uh, questions here. Uh, what do we use to build sure. system? Uh, we're using SBT. Again, pretty much stock um, stock play default type stuff. Uh, we had did a little bit of investigation um, in, in, in some other tools, but it seemed like SBT, even though SBT has a little bit of a steep learning curve, um, it, you know, it, it seemed like it was sort of the most widely known and supported tool, so we wanted to kind of, we didn't want to stray too far away um, uh, from, the, from the default. Uh, what do you think the effective size of a route file should be, 50 to 100 or less than 20, 30? Um, again, I think your mileage will vary with that, with that answer. Uh, I think we certainly have ones that are in the, in the 100 range, and that is, I think, for sure too big. Um, 
you know, depending on your on your business domain, uh, I would say that that uh, 20 or 30 is 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 ideal if you can get there. Um, but again, it's not going to be a real black and white answer for that. Uh, the question: How do you deal with DB changes? So um, we we do uh, the we do play evolutions pretty much for, for everything. So. Um, we manage, we started originally with generating some of the evolutions and now we've moved on to um, essentially manually creating the evolutions just to give our operations team a little more control over, over how those are executed. Um, but, but, we, but we essentially do manual, manual SQL evolutions. Just um, we, we found that that works better, better in our workflow. And then a question on, on how security handled in our application. Um, so you know that, that's a pretty that's a big broad topic. Um, we essentially use um, a, a, a request filter that does our authorization. We have just kind of standard standard homegrown um, authentication and, and cookies there, um, and then we use basically request filters that that delegates off to some components for doing for doing our own um, authorization. Okay, and then my one last question here that I see is, um, you think that listing some hot technologies like Play and Scala as a requirement for new engineers would attract better engineers? Well, honestly, that's something that we're, that we're hoping for. That's what we're shooting for is to, you know, we, Angie's List, we want to attract the kinds of people who are on these webinars, learning about Scala, learning about Play, um, and, and, you know, trying to keep their skills sharp and, and keep their game keep their game good because, you know, that, that's exactly what we wanted to, as an engineering organization, make the move from was from, you know, we were no longer just sort of a ho-hum, oh yeah, it's a database, website, you know, Microsoft stack, um, C-sharp kind of company that, you know, is it, a great place to work and Angie's List is, has a bunch of fantastic people but, you know, that's not exactly the, uh, the technology these days that attracts, you know, the truly top talent and so, you know, we wanted to we wanted to pull in some more of those highly motivated, adventurous, um, you know, engineers really willing to dig in and, and chart the course for the future. And so, you know, we felt like Play and Scala were were some good choices to attract some of those people. And so, you know, absolutely, we've we've essentially changed all of our job descriptions that we have available to to ask for Play and Scala. I mean, we realize it's not there aren't a gigantic glut of unemployed Scala programmers out there, you know, so it's, um, it's a tough market, but, but that's exactly what we want to do is, is find those kind of people and, and bring them on board and, and, and know that if you're, if you're in that camp, if you're someone who is interested in Scala and play, that, you know, coming onto Angie's List at this point in time is, is a really golden opportunity to make a big impact with our architecture and, and our code and, and what we're trying to do, so. Yes, that's that's for sure what we were going for there. All right, great. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to present today. Uh, we're going to have to hop off the line here um, and prepare for our next session. Um, thank you all for joining us. And um, if you're going to hang around for uh, the next presentation, which is um, uh, Kevin Weber, who is the lead architect with Walmart Canada website, he's going to be presenting enterprise web development with Play and Scala. So um, I'm going to end this session and see you back on the other side. Talk soon, guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Laura.